So for the entire first quarter of 2016 and then some, the seasons of Epiphany and Lent and Easter, we've been listening to the words of Paul from his letters to the Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. And so now it's time to turn back to the words of Jesus. I would like to begin a sermon series with you today in which we look at Jesus' clever little stories in the Gospel of Luke this season uh, called Parables. This first one is an early parable from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, starting at verse 4. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to Jesus, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of water. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As Jesus said this, he called out, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked Jesus what this story meant. Jesus said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others I speak in parables so that looking you may not perceive, and hearing you may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root, they believe only for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. As for what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for that is, is that is in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, Jesus was Jewish, of course, so it shouldn't surprise us that he was one of the greatest storytellers that's ever lived. But truth to be told, his short story collection was not an immediate bestseller. Maybe you can take some comfort from this if the New Yorker has recently turned down your latest submission, or Random House has returned your manuscript. Can you picture it way back there at the beginning? Word gets out among the intellectual elite of Palestine in the first century that there's this new hot shot preacher on the loose. He's making the TED Talk circuit. So all these rabbis from prominent Galilean synagogues and professors from Hebrew University in Jerusalem or start following Jesus around on his book tour. And you can see it, right? The bell rings, so to speak, and the teacher situates himself at the front of the room and clears his throat and says, the kingdom of God is like. A hush falls over the room. It's so quiet you can hear a lizard scurrying across the sandy floor. The kingdom of God is like. The PhDs move to the front of their chairs. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. What? The kingdom of God is like a sower who went out to sow. The kingdom of God is like a lamp that's not hid under a bushel. You are the salt of the earth, he says. Now, academia is full of legendary egos, of course, And no one will admit that they have no idea what's going on. So all these erudite rabbis and sophisticated professors just let Jesus go on and on with his silly stories of lost coins and prodigal sons and good Samaritans as if that last weren't the biggest oxymoron in the history of the Aramaic tongue. But Jesus' disciples are not proud. They're not PhDs. They're fishermen. 
And so they humbly ask, Jesus, what's going on here? Why are you always telling us these silly little stories? If you have something important to say, just come out and say it. And so one thing we learn from this morning's scripture lesson is that the initial reaction to Jesus' teaching is not, ah, but, huh? If he had something important to say, God's very word, God's very truth, why didn't he just come out and say it in an essay or a dissertation? But Jesus answers their question. He says to the disciples, the reason I speak to you in parables is that seeing you do not perceive and hearing you do not understand. In other words... God tried communicating to you with ten very specific instructions which you ignored with a vengeance. So then God tried again with the very vivid harangues of the prophets and you ignored them too. So now my father and I, we're just going to tell you some stories. The great fantasy author Madeline Lengel once said, Jesus was not a theologian. He was a God who told stories. Now, the Hebrew word for a parable is a word called mashal, which refers to a whole range of things like allegories, proverbs, metaphors, similes, poems. And the meaning of the word mashal seems to be best captured by talking about it as not plain speech. It's not an essay. It's not a declaration. It's not a dissertation. For instance, I once had a gentle, harmless, declawed cat named Spike. I don't know why my children gave that name to this cat, but that's what we called him. His name was Spike. Spike was black as Mammoth Cave. Spike was black as a Zulu warrior. Spike was blacker than a hundred midnights down in a cypress swamp. That's a parable. That's a mashal. Or here's a strange sentence. Susan is the golden retriever of our work group. It's a funny way of making a point, isn't it? But you know exactly what this person means. If Susan is the golden retriever of your work group, it means she is over-friendly, over-eager, always grinning from ear to ear, pathologically jealous of everyone's approval, emotionally needy, and quick to invade your space. It may be a compliment, and it may not be, but calling someone a golden retriever is crystal clear. That's a mashal. That's a parable. And, of course, you know where we get our English word parable, right? It comes from the Greek word for parable, parabola. And if you have an MBA, you know that a parabola is a line or a curve that you throw alongside a set of statistics so that you can tell what's going on graphically. So that you can tell, for instance, that Costco stock is going through the roof and Apple stock is crashing through the floor. By the way, stocks which go through the ceiling and crash to the floor, those are parables too. And this is how Jesus constantly gets his point across, by using not plain speech. Why? Emily Dickinson thinks she knows. Isn't that a wonderful poem I've printed for you in the bulletins? Tell all the truth, she says, but tell it slant. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children ease with explanation kind. The truth must dazzle gradually or everyone be blind. Yes, Tell the truth, says Emily Dickinson, but tell it slant. It's more fun that way. Truth's superb surprise is too bright for our infirm delight, and it has to be eased into our consciousness, as a mother might mitigate the fearsomeness of lightning by telling a gentle story about this beautiful, dazzling display for her children. Success in circuit lies. Come at the truth from the side. You might see it in a new way. It's more fun this way. Sometimes it means more when you throw the truth as a curve rather than as a fastball, as a parabola.
Now, one reason that Jesus' little stories work so well is that we live in a shape, a story-shaped world, don't we? We just love to tell our story because our lives are not essays. Our lives are not dissertations. They're not quite linear like that. Our lives are narratives. When someone asks Jesus, what is God like? It would never occur to him in a million years to say, well, the essential attributes of divinity are um, omniscience, omnipotence, immutability, infinity, and aseity. That's what Calvin would tell you. That's what Bart would tell you. That's not what Jesus says. It wouldn't occur to him in a million years to use these sesquipedalian words. When someone asks what Jesus is like, he says, a man had two sons. And then we are trapped in that story. Now what? A man had two sons. Did you ever pay any attention to Jesus' vocabulary? You know, for a pretty bright guy, he spoke a pretty rustic tongue. No Shakespeare he. His whole vocabulary is monosyllabic. Muscular nouns and snappy verbs and a few spare adjectives. He sounds like, well, he sounds like the guy who installed your kitchen cabinets, right? Because that's what he was, a carpenter. And so he abhors abstraction and eschews the sesquipedalian. And he would never use snooty words like eschews and sesquipedalian. And words ending in N-E-S-S and T-I-O-N and I-S-M are just not part of his vocabulary. He doesn't talk about forgiveness and stewardship and communism and capitalism. He talks about king, prophet, servant, father, sister. He belongs to that pantheon of heroic storytellers like Garrison Keillor, and Ernest Hemingway. I don't know if I should tell you this story. Well, what the heck. Garrison Keillor says that to retain our attention, a perfect short story has to have five elements. It has to have religion, money, family, sex, and mystery. And so Garrison Keillor says that the perfect short story is Oh my God, the banker's daughter said, I'm pregnant and I don't know who the father is. <laughs> Religion, money, family, sex, and mystery. If, if you didn't like that story, I'll have Joel take it out of the recording. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest Hemingway once used six words to tell a perfect, finished, poignant story. For sale, baby shoes, never used. <laughs> and a whole vivid tableau unfolds in our, in our imagination. For sale, baby shoes, never used. Have you seen Tim Burton's eccentric little film from 2003 called Big Fish? This belongs on my list of underrated films of vast but invisible cultural significance. A musical play based on this film was made a couple years ago. It tried out in Chicago. They took it to Broadway. I don't think the play did very well, but I love this film. This film is about a traveling salesman named Ed Bloon who tells so many outlandish stories that his son just gets disgusted with him. Son wonders, Dad, why don't you just tell me what really happened? And the son goes into journalism, just the facts, ma'am. And he gives up on his father who tells all these outlandish stories. They're too colorful. They're too loud. They're too big. They're too spectacular. They never could have happened. But then if you stick with this curious little film until the end, you find out that all these outlandish stories that could never have happened end up telling the truth better than the mere facts. It's very, very moving. We live in a story-shaped world, and you'd know this or you wouldn't waste your time reading Harry Potter or The Lord of the Rings. So this summer, we're going to listen to several of Jesus' rustic little homilies. And we're going to pay attention to the content, but also to the way they work on us, the way they become God's Word in our interior being. 
No, he won't lay down the rules. He won't give you a list. Jesus is not into the Ten Commandments or the seven habits of highly successful people or the four cardinal virtues or the seven deadly sins. Jesus doesn't like lists. He tells stories. Did they happen? No. Are they true? Yes. When in history did the prodigal son run away from home and squander his inheritance on riotous living? Never and always. As Frederick Buechner puts it, these stories Jesus tells every once in a while, it's not just the point that we see, but ourselves that we see, each other that we see, God that we see. The whole great landscape of things lit up for a moment as if by lightning on a dark night. Jesus doesn't want us to see the point. He wants us to see ourselves. He wants us to see each other. He wants us to see God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen.